Hey guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we're going to be talking about the necessary mindset shifts that you need to homestead and some really exciting news about the School of Traditional Skills Summit and how it's kind of addressing some of those things. Well, and some free training, a week's worth of free training coming up here. That's really good. And it, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. I'm excited about it and I'm excited about the angle and the, the, uh, the way it's going to really help with some really specific things that we've seen people struggle with. Yeah. So before we jump into the main topic, though, time for a little bit of chit chat. Chit chat, you betcha. What are you up to? Oh, <laughs> lots of harvesting. We yeah, are harvest in the, season is on. We are in the thick of harvesting right now. Um, we had a really warm May this year, so we're actually we're struggling with the opposite problem that we usually have. Usually, we're like, mm. you know hurry, 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 here comes the frost. Like, we, we've got to get it in. Hopefully it gets right before the frost hits, Which right? Which we'll, we'll probably still bump into that with some things, but yeah. Probably. But right now we're going, uh, this thing's ready to harvest and it's not cold out. And that's kind of a problem for a couple of things that should be root cellared. Mm -hmm. Because our root cellar is in not cold. a basement and it's not cold. It's, <laughs> it's actually quite warm right now. Yeah. And so I'm kind of trying to figure out what to do about that. Um, cabbage is the number one problem right now for this. We successfully grew gorgeous cabbage so one of this our year. Best years of cabbage, best I think, year. ever. 65 foot row packed, filled with cabbage. And it's already right now, and it's hot outside. And so there's no just like sticking it the in the root cellar. Um, so we're making a little extra sauerkraut right now. <laughs> All the heads that are like ready to burst, we're, um, we're turning into sauerkraut early and getting those packed away. Uh, but the crab apples are ready. The uh, plums are almost ready. We've already had the early apples in. We've had a bunch of applesauce made. So we're just kind of like humming right along. In some ways, it feels a little more spread out. It's like every week we have a major preserving project instead yeah. of like two weeks of just like every day is a major preserving project. Um, but in other ways, it's just kind of a weird year. It's a little off and a little, I don't know, what is normal anymore? Is there such a thing as normal? I don't think there ever was. I think that that's uh, uh, think a myth to a degree. I mean, there are certainly patterns that stabilize and maybe we're very destabilized. We're definitely destabilized in a lot of different ways. <laughs> But I think weather, I think a lot of different things that we want to see as normal, there's often a lot more variability. And I think that's the reality of working with nature mm -hmm. and the homesteading life. In our modern life, we've gotten used to, we can normalize the temperature in our right. house. We can normalize the work day or the school day. There's a flow, there's a pattern that's very easy to control. We can take our vacation here, we can do this and that. And so I think actually what we struggle with is the reality that as we step into a homesteading life and we have to deal with more of the realities of nature, uh, of biology, the intersection of biology and chemistry and weather and yeah. personality, <laughs> that we realize there's actually a lot more variability in, in the natural life than we've become accustomed to in the modern life. I like that, the, the myth of normal. That, that, that is kind yeah. of like, yeah, that's good there. So, so what's the, what's the thing about mindsets, which we're going to be talking about a lot here today and over the coming weeks, mm -hmm. and honestly we do in one way or another all the time, what's the mindset that goes for you with the shift of, wow, this is a very different preservation year. I've got, you know, we work hard to kind of spread things out and, and, and make the harvest doable. That's one of the mindsets, right? But then it's not going that way, and it's like, so what's the mindset that, that uh, um, you have to adapt to deal with that? Because obviously that yeah. affects other areas of life, because now you're having to preserve a lot more in a season, or worry about like, oh, what am I going to do with the cabbage, since right. it's uh, not cold enough yet to get it in the cellar. We'll call it the mindset of fluidity. Fluidity, I yeah, like it. I, I don't like flexibility because flexibility implies some sort of like rigidity that can break, right? Like, okay. if you're flexible, it yeah. means you're breakable. Somewhere also, there's a breaking point, there, even if you're a, very flexible. And into Flu the flexibility. Fluidity, it doesn't fluidity, break. Fluidity, you're it, going it, with the flow. Yeah, I like it. Okay, so cool. we're, we're calling this a mind. You can't Mindset get too of, hung up, cool. honestly, on it. Yeah. 
Like you can't, I can't be like, but I was going to root cellar those and just stick them in the root cellar anyways. Right now it wouldn't work. Right, you would. Right, root cellar is just break. not cool enough right now. <laughs> it's just yeah. not going to work, and so we're having to be fluid and just kind of go with the flow. Same thing with the milk cow. Some of you guys have been following along with our uh, 2023 milk cow drama that we have right now. <laughs> I think we've we're wrapping up the drama, but uh, Tilly, our long-standing wonderful milk cow, came up open this year. Um, and honestly, we weren't really maybe paying enough attention to catch it before it was a surprise that, wait, isn't she supposed to be having a calf sometime? <laughs> and, uh, and then there was no milk, yeah. which is a big deal, right? Like the house. cheese cave, you can't see it right now, but there's a cheese cave sitting over there. It's it empty. is empty, which is not good for this time of year. It should be half full to start getting us through the winter. Mm. And so uh, we do now have a milk cow, sweet little June. June, everybody calls her June Bug, the milk cow. She's very nice. And she's giving us a little less milk than we'd be expecting from Tilly this time of year. She's We're doing, getting about yeah. four, four and a half gallons a day. The, we also have the goats now, so we're getting one and a half to two gallons. Quite a bit from, of milk coming in. Yeah, yeah, so we're doing well. So we're going to start catching up on the cheese department. But you know, it's it's being fluid with the season and not getting too hung up on what it should be and just taking the next step to solving the the problem. Fluid mindset. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Fluid. Fluid. Yeah. Anyways, what have you been up to? Wow, well, um, you know, the big focus right now is barn addition. That might sound like old news because we did that last year. We're adding on to the other side so that we've got <laughs> space to store all our wood shavings and a place to feed our cows and do the deep bedding and all of that. And they're saying up here in Idaho that North Idaho just can't have enough roof space. Mm -hmm. And um, But we're growing. The animals are increasing. You know, we've got uh, one son at least that's interested in... in um, Homes in farming, right. not just homesteading. I, I separate them right there myself. Right. Um, so, anyways, that's the big project right now that I need to get done before the snow flies, and we got plenty. We got a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we have plenty of time. We have a lot of time, <laughs> but I don't know if it's plenty of time. So that's that's the big project besides just general um, maintenance and keeping the keeping the animals rotating around the pasture and yeah, and dealing with a lot of things breaking. I mean. <laughs> Vehicle, what we had like two or three I cars in the shop at one time, and this thing's breaking, and the just stuff's breaking all over the place. So that's that just takes a mindset of fluidity right there, and not letting it get to you because it just <laughs> seems like every time I turn around, something's breaking. We're pretty good at maintaining things, we don't generally have a lot of problems with that. But right now it's He walks hard. in the door and I'm like, do you want today's report? I'm like, do you want the list of things that are broken now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that puts me to research to try to find parts, to like push, to like, hey, Connor, can you fix this? Go watch YouTube. You know, just a lot of scrambling. But there's that. But then there's getting ready for the School Traditional Skills Summit, which is a high focus for me because mm -hmm. that is a week of hanging out with a lot of our instructors and well-known instructors and, and teachers as we're going to be talking about a lot of different things around systems and mindsets. And I'm reading a book right now that I wanted to share a little bit uh, with you. And this book, if you guys, I don't know if you're familiar with John Lovell, the Warrior Poet Society. Now, he's mostly speaking to men here. And, but this is a book about mindsets, mental mindsets, and the warrior and the poet and the complete man, really. But okay. John is, while well, he's, if you know him from YouTube, he's a firearms trainer, ex-Special Forces guy, neat guy. Um, but he's also a homesteader. And I wanted to share with you something that just is a little bit motivating. It's not so much mindset, but taking us back a little bit to some past mindsets and kind of why we're doing what we're doing. So this is uh, out of uh, the Warrior Poet Way. Europeans in the 18th century, seeking freedom from Britain tyranny, fled across the Atlantic Ocean in droves to settle in North America. What they were looking for was a little patch of earth to call their own. Uh, that sounds like us in a lot of ways today, even though we're not going across the ocean. They wanted to build a home, plant some crops, have some kids, and be left alone from those who sought to control and exploit them. I think we can definitely relate with that today. Freedom didn't just mean the opportunity to do what you wanted. It was to them the right to be left alone to live as they pleased. Classically, a home was considered less a presentation of one's social status and thought more of as a pragmatic means of survival. 
The home was meant to be a refuge from the world. It was set up to self-sustain a family against cold winters, starvation, wild animals, and marauders. There was no power grid to plug into and no grocery stores down the street. A family lived surrounded by their livestock and crops. They cut firewood and seasoned it for cooking and heat. Your vocation may have supplemented your ability to stay alive, but your homestead was the real way you endured. And I actually wanted to read quite a bit more, but that's going to take some time. Um, let me just end with this. There has never been a better time to learn to live more self-sufficiently. Taking care of yourself and providing for your basic needs is an essential part of the masculine journey. Again, he's speaking mostly to men here, but it applies to all of us. It's an opportunity to become a better provider too, because you've insulated yourself against all kinds of socioeconomic crises that may arise. Mm. And I love that mindset. John, I don't know if you'll ever see this, love the book. Um, and I just love the thought of the mindset that we need to have here in these day and times and remember what we're doing and what a home is and what a homestead right. is. They didn't call that homesteading, but they were doing the same thing. They were looking to break free from the systems that they were in bondage mm. to and create real security and health for you know, themselves, their families, and ultimately society. Yeah. you know, in that goal. And that, that's, that's a lot of what we're doing here today. <laughs> it is a lot of what we're doing here today. You know, I find it interesting that historically land was valued based on what it could produce. Yes. Right? Not on the social status aspect, the Not view, the, social... the, the... Right. All the... And we've totally lost that. And yeah. now it's, yeah, now it's the view or it's the location or it's, you know, whatever it is. And... Um, and I find that fascinating that, you know, I look at prices of something like an uh, apartment in New York, right? You don't, you don't even have enough real estate hardly to turn around. And <laughs> you're paying this huge amount. And I think, oh, my goodness, if something went wrong, like, and you were living in that place, you have zero capability of taking care of yourself. And I think that and, just, and you're that paying seems, an exorbitant. And you're paying and, for and it. And you have no self-sufficiency. It, it just is... I think there's a time that we are going to regret that as a culture, that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be like, I was paying for the wrong thing. Um, I think that so. time is now. I mean, you know, it is happening now. People are moving people away are from that it. situation. They're, they're realizing where security is, where real freedom is. Yeah. Real freedom isn't just doing whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's wrapped up in security and taking care of the people that you love and a, and a healthy culture and society yeah. and being able to organize that the way you want and live that the way you want. Today, we want just the freedom to just be comfortable and consume and do whatever we want. Whatever, whenever. That's actually <laughs> a path to bondage is what that is. Yeah. 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 Well, Anyways, that's, there you go. I'm thinking a lot I about like those it. things, and we're going to talk about the summit a little bit today, and because while we're always talking skills, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, these concepts. Yeah. That's the theme of the summit. But before we get to that and mindsets, mm -hmm. uh, we had a question or two here. Question of the day. I think you said um, question number two from Becca Gonthier. Hi, Josh and Carolyn. I hope you are all, all well. We are. Thank you, Becca. I have a question about the fermented ketchup recipe. Every time I make it, I'm sorry, I just need my glasses to read. Uh, every time I make it, the consistency by the end of the fermentation has solidified in my jar. Do you know why this happens? I have never seen that happen. Um, hasn't happened to us. I have... I actually have got to wonder about the tomato paste you're using. If it has any strange thickener in it, that it's then thickening down. Mm. So I would check the ingredients on that. Maybe use a different one, but then um, a different brand of tomato paste um, and just try that and see what happens. But you might also try changing whatever uh, fermented starter you're using, whatever liquid you're using, and try something else. Uh, you know, go to the, if you're using a kombucha right now as your starter, go to like a, you know, vegetable, the brine off of a vegetable that's been fermented and try that and see if that helps. Because ours definitely does not do that. It um, maybe gets a little bit looser during the fermenting process, but not, not more solid. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, Amanda Vandenberg on old-fashioned egg pre preservation. Do you have a preference of taste between freeze-dried or glassed eggs? Interesting Ooh, question. Good question. So if the water glassed eggs are fairly fresh, meaning you know they're, we're not pushing their storage ability, then the two of them taste pretty much identical. I don't think that there is a big difference. Um, so for me, it would really come down to how long am I wanting to store these eggs? And what am I wanting to do with them? If you're wanting to just store them for the year, then the water glassing is absolutely fine, especially if you're wanting to be able to do something like fried eggs out of them, then, you know, go, go that direction. If you're wanting to go, you know, a year and beyond with your freeze dried eggs and you don't mind having only like scrambled eggs then, or eggs for baking, then the freeze dried eggs are great that way. But, um, but you can definitely put up more water glassed eggs more quickly than you can freeze drying. Freeze drying, you have the limit of, you know, the tray size and how long it takes to run it. Well, so. and a lot less expensively, obviously. That's yeah, why right. it's the method that it is historically, <laughs> right. you know, because it was very simple to do and they didn't have freeze dryers or canners or anything else. And it was, yeah, I yeah. mean, even nowadays doing a whole buckets of eggs are super inexpensive, assuming yeah. you're, you know, not counting the cost of the egg. But um, the actual preservation yeah. of it itself is super cheap. So. You do have a volume issue. That's one of the things I've noticed, you know, mm -hmm. how many eggs you can store from the freeze dryer when you're trying to put up a lot of food. You do, you do get a volume. The glassed uh, eggs takes a lot of volume. The, the water glassed eggs take yeah. a lot of volume. Yeah. Yes, yeah. they do because they, you're storing them in their shell so they right. don't all settle in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So I think they taste about the same though as long as those water glassed eggs are still not old. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today we're talking a little bit about mindset when it comes to homesteading. And I think this is something that Josh and I have both seen as we've had on farm events, we've had interns, even our own children, is that you kind of have these two different parts to learning homesteading. And one is you have the actual skill, yeah, right? The skill to do a particular thing. Whatever it is, you know, you want to can, you have to learn how to can, you want to um, raise chickens, you have to actually learn how to do that and the steps to doing that. But then the other side is the mindset side because the mindset has to be different to be a successful homesteader than it is from your average everyday city life. There's mm -hmm. actually significant differences. And we've started seeing that this is the place where a lot of people are getting really hung up and they're starting to have challenges because of this mindset thing, the, yeah. the, the, the shift that needs to be taken. And I don't know if we even have it all 100% quantified, like what are the exact mindset, <laughs> that's hard to say, mindset <laughs> shifts that need to happen. Um, but I think we have a few that I've been noticing in people um, that really could help them be successful in homesteading. Yeah. And so I think by mindsets, it's, it's a way of thinking about things and approaching things, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's great to know how to can, freeze dry, water glass eggs. How do you apply all those things in a way that works for you in your situation right. in space and time when... One garden year is different than the next, right? Mm -hmm. There's all these dynamics that yeah. affect the skill that you do right. and when mm -hmm. and how and what's the best skill for you to do. It's, yeah. a, it's really a hard thing to articulate. So it's something, I mean, it's something the pantry chat was really created to articulate when right. we realized years ago we needed another way to talk about things that wasn't just teaching how, a skill. How, how to, to do videos. a skill. Yeah. How do we explore these ideas and thoughts? And I think we're getting to the point, like, how do we start to better articulate and talk about mindsets right and um, so do you have do you have one in mind oh you're... I have a few of them that uh, one is observation okay I think it's very natural for us in our modern world to just go do right 
Mm -hmm. to just go, and you've talked about this a lot uh, in regards to like property planning and design of the property with permaculture, mm -hmm. but even just in day-to-day -day life, like it's very easy to want to just go do things and go practice that skill. Like, okay, I'm going to learn how to can and tomorrow I'm going to can. Like, you have to put it into the context of the whole. What right. all is going on? And especially as you get different systems and different things running in the homestead, you've got the garden, you've got some animals, you know, you're running the kitchen, you've got, you know, your preservation going on. One has to always be affecting the other. Right. And in order to be able to see that system as a whole, you have to stand back and you have to look at it. You have to give yourself some room to think and to plan. And this is one thing that I've talked about quite a bit when I talk about household management, homestead management, is this like walking around with a notebook and not doing anything. Like don't stop and weed the garden, just walk through the garden and look and observe and take your notes. Like that's your only job that you're doing is mm -hmm. looking at things. What's going to need to be picked you know, what, what do I need to pick today? What do we need to pick tomorrow? What's going to be coming in shortly? What's not coming in on schedule? Yeah. You know, how is this all going? How do the plants look? Are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Um, but doing that in the context of your whole homestead, like walking through your kitchen, walking through your pantry, walking through the barn, walking through all these areas and just giving yourself time to observe. Because I think we really have this lack in modern day. We're, we're so used to being maybe a little bit the cog in the wheel, like just mm -hmm. that one little piece and we just are gonna focus and just do our one little thing. We're not used to standing back and having to observe the whole thing and make adjustments based on all these other things that are happening. Well, and it comes with a modern life, you know, an older life when you have to deal with weather more, mm -hmm. you have to deal with predators more, you have to deal with marauders, John's mentioned in there in his book, <laughs> you know, whatever the threat is, we don't have to deal with I think a lot. those are flea beetles on our property. Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have to deal with as many of those threats, right. and so we don't have to be observant. Yeah. You know, but we do as homesteaders, we do as we're re-engaging. And honestly, if the world's going where a lot of us thinks it's going, mm -hmm. we need to really be using our homesteads and our homesteading life as training because we are going right. to face more different kinds of threats that we need to be more observant about. And mm -hmm. so it becomes a continual yeah. mindset. You know, I trained the kids. I was just talking to one of, one of our little boys today about weed whacking and mm -hmm. he had just kind of gone through and done the job. And you know, I tell them, you, you haven't done the job if you haven't stopped and observed. Yeah. Like you don't just go through and weed whack an area. Right. When you're done, preferably while you're doing the job, you stop and look before you leave an area, you observe. But when you're done, certainly, you actually haven't finished the job if you haven't stood back, looked, and observed your work and said, did I get everything? Right. That's just another angle and observation. But yeah, that's a, that is a... I mean, I'd put that up there. We haven't listed these out yet somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a project to do, but I'd, I'd put that up there as a pretty high yeah. important mindset. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think another one that I've really seen in people, especially right now, and this is, this is really important, I think, is that there, there's this, such this urgency to like learn and get these systems in place and start filling the pantries and the barns and everything else that's going on. Um, and just this urgency to do that there is a lack of balance in the enjoyment and the being still side hmm. too. And that's, you and I are bad at that. You know, we're, we're just mm, going to go, 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 go. go. Yeah. And it's, this is how people burn out. This is one of the reasons people burn out and they go, 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 go until, you know, they're five years in they're like, I just don't want to live this way. Yeah. This is crazy. Or they and can so, consume all their resources. That on the other financial, side. Financial, yeah. physical, right. whatever. Yeah. yeah. But approaching things with a balance. Yeah. And that's another mindset that has to be, yeah. you know, built in there. Another one is um, slow is fast and fast is slow. Oh, this and is so this good. Is very applicable to animals, yes. but uh, as I've talked to people, as the kids and I have talked, they, I watch them bring it out in different areas, and I'm, I'm having a hard time recalling. Somebody was just recalling this in another area, but um, you know, with the animals, it's very prevalent. We, we're just so conditioned and want to like push through that mentality of just right. do do do, but we want to get it done. So we're often pushing and moving fast. It almost always slows us down. The work's got to be redone. We cause problems uh, mm -hmm. if you're working with animals. Yeah, and you're trying to push those animals hard, they go every which way. 
but when you're willing to go slow, it's so it's always faster. And I remember a very poignant conversation with our oldest son Tristan trying to get a bull in in a like three acre field, one bull, two of us on foot, and we're feeling in a hurry. We need to get somewhere, you know, and having to slow down and go. You gotta take your time. Yeah. Slow is fast. Fast is slow. And hmm. That's very good. Good one to remember. It's, it's, I mean, it's really unlimited, and this is a, is a fun type of conversation to have, and I would encourage you guys to be thinking about the mindsets on each of your own homesteads steads and that you need, but we are about to have a week-long session at the yeah. School of Traditional Skills, the second annual Traditional Skills Summit here, uh, starting September 11th, where the theme is talking about mindsets and systems right. around homesteading skills. Yeah. And so we're going to dive into this, and I'm going to dive into this with a whole lot of neat people. Sean and Beth Doherty, Justin Rhodes, mm -hmm. Joel Salatin, uh, Sally Fallon Morrell, Carolyn Thomas. I'll be there. <laughs> Dr. Patrick Jones, uh, Adam Martin, who I'm really excited to introduce a lot of people to. He is a uh, mostly natural beekeeper, and I, and I like that mostly because he keeps it real. Um, he's found a very, very good balance that I think is awesome for us homesteaders. Oh, good. Yeah. And um, so, anyways, we're going to be talking about mindsets around these people's different, you know, specialties and skill sets. Yeah, I know that. I'm going to be talking about mindset shifts that need to happen around getting three meals on the table every single day yeah. and like how you actually do that. And it does take shifting your mindset. You, you have to approach it differently than you approach it, you know, going to the grocery store all the time and having convenience foods and, you know, going to take out and all of that. You actually have to change your mindset in order to make that work. And when you do, it actually can all fall into place. Yeah. And so, you know, each of these different subjects has these little mindset things that have to change in order to make them really, really click yeah. and really work. And so it's so exciting to be able to have so many different brilliant minds. Can I say that oh. since I'm on the list? Wow. <laughs> but I mean, Joel Salatin coming, Dr. Patrick Jones, Sally Fallon yep. Morrell. I mean, that's this is exciting to get to talk to all of these people and understand how their mindset shifts have helped them be successful at what they're doing. Right. You know, we've got Sean and Beth Doherty, who are new instructors this year for the School of Traditional Skills, and uh, they're going to be talking about making the most of what you have. So that mindset of making do, right, right. is the old phrase and the short phrase, making do. And, mm -hmm. and they've been homesteading for 27 years on low budget <laughs> and pro thoroughly providing for themselves. And so that is a mindset, is looking for opportunity, you know, to make do and working with what you have. So that, that's a great one that's coming. Yeah. Uh, another one that's going to build on what you're talking about, or maybe you're going to build, I don't know quite the differences, but that's Shannon Hayes. Uh, really excited about in creating an efficient kitchen. Oh, that's yeah, a good one. And that's exciting. Efficiency in the kitchen. I mean, a lot of what we're doing is about food, right? right? So whether it's the three meals a day or whether it's just managing the kitchen and how to be efficient through there. Yeah. Th you know, uh, um, just a lot of neat, neat, uh, stuff here. Sally yeah. Fallon Morrell is talking about creating a legacy of health. Ooh, that's a good one. You yeah, know, that definitely takes some mindset shifts. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. But even Brandon Sheard talking about becoming a home butcher, becoming yeah. your own home butcher, like that, that seriously, I know for us, there were mindset shifts, specifically for me, that really had to take place in order to get to this like, oh, we can do this. This isn't a problem. And I can cook off the meat that we've cut yeah. like this. But it, it, it's actually more mental. All, all of these things, you can get the how-tos. And the how-tos are so important. You have to learn the actual skill of doing it. Otherwise, you're kind of dead in the water. But until you're able to take that how-to and combine it with that mindset shift, yeah. you can't actually effectively apply it. It just becomes this thing that you know, but you don't know how to turn it into a lifestyle. And well, that, to integrate it, yeah. It, to integrate it, and that's really the difference here. So this is going to be really exciting to get to spend a whole week focusing on how to make that mindset shift. Yep. Yeah. So really, really want to invite you guys, if you haven't signed up, yeah. I know a lot of you probably already have, but if you haven't, get signed up for this. I know you probably can't make it to all the sessions, you know, but there will be replays. Yeah. And um, you know another cool thing? I don't know that they'll be talking about so much about mindsets, but we have sponsors this year. Oh. 
that are going to be doing some free trainings. Oh. Redmond is going to be doing some free training between the instructor sessions. Oh. And um, are they going to be teaching about salt and salt and minerals and soil oh. and a lot of good stuff? So I don't know that their angle is mindsets, but it's going to be really neat. So we've got that. This is packed full. It's so really exciting. I'm, I'm going to have to go back over the next month or two and You're watch be some of them. It. I mean, I'm not going to be all in the main ones, but. We've got another group that's coming and talking about the mindset of money and, and oh. financial investment as well. A little bit different than what we think of the homesteading skills, but it is a little more putting your, your value, your investments in more traditional pathways. I'll leave it at that, um, you know, for investment, which is another important thing for us is we're living the life we're living for the reasons that we're doing it and creating resiliency and security against you know, government, socioeconomic, whatever. Um, so super, super cool stuff. This is really packed full and I'm gonna go off on a trail because I just like to tell you everything about it, but <laughs> want to make sure that you get signed up for this, get on the list. And here's another really, really cool one. Oh, Harvest Right is giving away a freeze dryer. An entire, oh. nearly four thousand dollars worth of value. Oh wow! Yeah, giving and it away to giving to, a, to somebody one who's to somebody that's registered for the summit. So okay. another great reason right there to sign up and make sure you catch a few of those sessions. And and there's going to be some other cool stuff too that I don't have all the details to yet. But a lot of neat things, all wrapped around mindset. And you know, mm -hmm. like Carolyn was saying. This life, we, we got to learn the skills, but it's really the mindset that helps us integrate these different skills into our life and the way that we're living that makes all of this work. And so we're going to be exploring that for a whole week. That's really neat because I feel like there's a, there is a shift happening in the conversation around homesteading right now where mm -hmm. it is going from this, this very, like, everybody's trying to figure out the skills. Everybody's trying to figure out how to ferment. Everybody's trying to figure out how to keep animals and mm -hmm. how to rotate now the quest question that I'm hearing a lot is how do we make this all work? Like how do we actually make yeah. life happen with all these skills? And so this is really exciting because th this is what this is what we're all thinking about collectively in homesteading right now. And it's like, okay, this is great, but what does life look like on the other side? And that's where the mindset is. So And that's what really keeps neat. you going for the long haul mm -hmm. and prevents burnout mm -hmm. and exhaustion is working through these things, discovering these mindsets yeah. and putting them to work just like a skill. So. so if you have another mindset struggle that you are dealing with, mm. that you realize you're dealing with, put it in the comments below. We'd love to hear about that. And then we will make sure to get you a link to be able to sign up for the School of Traditional Skills Summit, the Traditional Skills Summit 23. Is that what it is officially? The Traditional Skills Summit 23. Sure, that works. <laughs> okay. That works. Um, we'll make sure to get you a link there so you can sign up for that. And we're really excited to get to see you over there. Make sure you come over and say hi to my presentation. <laughs> That'll be fun. I'm always scared nobody's going to show up. I don't know. I don't get it. Do you guys you get it? You just got to kind of wave you get, at me I don't and be get like, it. I'm here. You're doing good. And then you can leave. That's all. <laughs> all right. You're you going to pack the house just all right. like you did at the conference. <laughs> Great hanging with you guys. And look forward to seeing you at the summit. And look forward to seeing you here next time for the next Pantry Chat. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.